Sally Hobart Alexander and her husband, co-author Robert, hold a book signing in Pittsburgh, their hometown, following a Sunday church service. The book she authored is called She Touched the World, and it's about Laura Bridgman, a deaf-blind pioneer. Likewise, Sally is blind. It's a great book, great story, great inspiration. The first printing was in 2008, and it's splendid to have an autographed copy. <laughs> Laura Bridgman was taught to read, and at some point we're going to read a little bit about that, but I thought we would do this much now. After she learned to feel raised letters on paper, and she learned to read, and she understood that actually words, you know, she got the concept that objects like a key or a knife or a spoon, they have meaning, they have um, Names. You know, she was. She had no idea that the things that she was feeling when she set the table for her mother, she didn't know that a fork was a fork or a knife was a knife. She didn't know the names. So, anything is anything. Pardon? <laughs> right. Well, she ended up learning to read, and she was just crazy mad for words. Well, then her teacher taught her the manual alphabet of the deaf. And she picked that up in one afternoon. And soon, she was able to fingerspell as quickly with her fingers as we talk with our voices. Even when she was asleep and dreaming, her fingers were moving in her dreams. If you go into any library, you're going to find at least a hundred books about Helen Keller. I think what happened, truthfully, is that um, Helen, you know, when Laura was at age 10, 11, and 12, she was considered the most famous person in the United States. They said only Queen Victoria of England was more famous in the world. You know, she, everybody came. She was a big tourist attraction in Boston. They came to see her. But what happened is that she got old. Helen Keller came and was so young and charming and adorable. And she Helen... She was better looking. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, she was beautiful. And, um, but not more so than a bit But I was. what also happened is Helen had smell and taste. I don't mean to say she was only deaf and blind because that's huge. <laughs> but she was. She had two more working senses. She had a teacher, Ann Sullivan, who actually learned to fingerspell from Laura Bridgman, by the way. And Ann Sullivan lived with her. And she was immersed in words. She was immersed in language. And Laura was taught maybe, you know, three hours a day or so. She had, um, by the time that she was uh, 20 years old, she had no one, no person, no family member. It was an enormous thing to be her companion. It was exhausting. She used people like an extra sense. And she, so she didn't have that kind of steady, companionship and um, so she really did not have the accomplishments that Helen Keller had but Helen Keller was the first person to say that without Laura Bridgman she herself would not have had any accomplishments whatsoever because Laura was the, Laura was the blueprint for Helen she was the pioneer it's, it's tough to be a pioneer yeah. <laughs> You know, but, you we know, look back um, on them, but it was very tough for them, and she was just eclipsed by Helen completely. Her, her dates are 1829 to 1889, so Helen Keller was, I forget what 80, 80 to 68, 1880 80 to, to, 68. to 1968. So, actually, they met, um, Laura Bridgman met Helen Keller, and um, uh, Helen did meet the Laura Bridgman standards for deportment at that point. She was a little wild and 
And, she was uh, eight years old and yeah. Laura was 58. And actually, it was, it was by reading about Laura Bridgman and Dickens America, Charles Dickens' American Notes that Mrs. Keller, Helen Keller's mother, realized that there was hope that her, her daughter could be educated. But uh, so, so Laura was born in 1829. At age two, um, she got uh, what was called scarlet fever. It might have been meningitis. Nobody really knows what it was. They, they seem to have used the term very broadly back then to mean various different kinds of infectious diseases that were accompanied by, by elevated temperature of some kind. But it left her, as Sally said, blind, uh, completely deaf, and with uh, residual smelling and taste, a little bit of smelling and taste. And over time, she got to be able to, to work her way around the, the little farmhouse where she lived. She did chores. She was very active and intelligent, running around all the time. And uh, she came to the attention, because of her, her intelligence and zippiness, she came to, attention, to the attention of Dr. Reuben Mussey, who was a very distinguished professor of medicine at Dartmouth, who wrote about her in the newspapers. And this is where Samuel Gridley Howe heard about her. He was a very active 19th century reformer. He had his hands in everything, abolition and, and um, prison reform. You name it, he was involved in it. And one of, he had just become the director of the Perkins Institution for the Blind. And one of his ambitions was to educate a person who was blind and deaf. It was thought at the time that this was not possible. For instance, there was a Julia Brace who uh, gets mentioned a lot in 19th century literature who was in a Hartford asylum who was completely, she, she just couldn't do anything. She was blind and deaf, she couldn't communicate, she was completely isolated. So, uh, Howe heard about Laura Bridgman and he went up to, to see her along with Longfellow and Horace Mann and other people who became great, great lights of, of uh, New England 19th century his, history, had a little short uh, exam and uh, persuaded the parents to um, let him take Laura to Perkins to be, to be educated. And um, I can read just a little short part of um, the book here to give you an idea of how this, how this worked. This is the the process by which Laura learned language. It's chapter seven is called Words, Words, Words. Of course, Laura didn't know Doctor's thoughts. She didn't know he was debating between two different approaches to working with her. Give her random signs based on the signs she had already invented with her parents and Asa, who was an elderly gentleman that, that uh, uh, took care of her sometimes. Or teach her the alphabet so that she could express anything she wanted. Howe wrote that teaching her letters seemed very difficult, yet he decided to try that approach. Laura was not aware of Dr. Howe's goal as she sat with him and another person, his assistant, Lydia Drew. On the table in front of her were everyday objects, a knife, a spoon, a book, and a key. Laura touched them all, recognizing them, though not able to identify them by name. She picked up the key. It felt very much like the key she'd used at home to lock her boot in the cupboard. Wait! This key had a piece of paper fastened to it. The paper with several letters of the alphabet embossed, raised, so that Laura could feel their shape with her fingertip. Another touch reading system had already been invented by the young blind Frenchman Louis Braille, which used a series of six raised dots instead of letters. But Laura didn't learn. The Braille system wasn't widely employed until well past the time of Laura's schooling. Now, sitting between Dr. and Miss Drew, Laura ran her finger over the raised letters. She felt the other objects and found that they had also had raised print labels attached to them. Laura ran her finger over each object and over each label. As her hands worked, her mind stirred. The knife and spoon were different from each other. The lines of the raised word knife were different from the raised lines for spoon. Stroke, tap, scratch gently with a fingernail. Laura concentrated. The different combinations of raised letters belong to each object. Eventually, the words pushed into her mind, her consciousness. She began to understand that the embossed labels identified the objects. Doctor patted her head. Miss Drew hugged her. Laura smiled. She moved closer to the table, her mind racing. 
her heart too. Next, Howe removed the labels and shuffled them in a pile. Laura found the label for a knife and placed it on the knife. A pat from, La from Doctor, a squeeze from Ms. Drew, more smiles from Laura. Finally, Laura worked with single raised letters on separate pieces of paper. Howe gave Laura the key, then mixed up the letters K, E, and Y. Laura put the letters in the correct order. Pat smiled. On the third day, like a wave crashing on the shore, Laura's breakthrough came. Neither Laura nor her teachers remembered the exact word later, but they recalled that her smile became a broad grin, her laughter contagious. She threw her arms around her teachers, then rushed from object to object to name each with its label. Howe wrote that all at once the truth began to flash upon her, her intellect began to work, she perceived that here was a way by which she could make herself a sign of anything that was in her own mind and show it to another mind. Words. Laura was dizzy with them. <laughs> here, are the num here are the various drafts of Laura Bridgman. <laughs> Now, we talk about revision, <laughs> and I just thought you would be interested to know, the very first, the first draft of the Laura Bridgman book was about 100 pages. I wrote it for teenagers, and my editor um, at Viking wanted it very much, but she, her boss said no. No one knows this woman. It won't sell any books. And today, <laughs> I think we can dispute that. But anyway, <laughs> I just hope she's eating her heart out. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> I wrote it anyway. And because at that point, I was just sending a couple chapters in an outline. So I wrote it. And it probably took me nine months to a year to write this draft. And you have to know that every draft, uh, I think Yoli and Joan and Franny and everyone that's here who's a writer can tell you it represents probably 25 drafts, really. Then I s sent it to an editor who said, I would really love the story, but teenagers don't read biographies. What about making it for 8 to 12 year olds? So I shrank the book to 55 pages. And that probably took me another six months, I would say, with all the rewriting I was doing. I went to a conference. There was another editor. She read the first five pages, and she said, Sally, make this a picture book, because then you can have illustrations. So I shrank the book to eight pages and literally choked the life out of it, I think. I was writing it from the point of view of Laura's cat that she threw on the blazing logs of the fireplace. And, uh, you know, if the cat survived, I was going to have him up in some branch watching everything. <laughs> but the trouble was, Laura left Hanover and went to Boston. So how was she, the cat going to tell the story? So I wrote 20 pages of that before I realized, no way. Well, I, around 2004, I turned to Bob and I said, you've got to be co-author because I need you to go into the archives with me and read the millions and billions of letters that Laura wrote. And I needed, you know, the, I won't go into all the challenges of a blind person trying to get these primary documents that are not recorded and not in Braille. So Bob was reluctant, but he finally agreed. And then I decided to write it in multiple <coughs> points of view and in light of uh, free verse in poems and I sent it to my agent who said I don't think that your 8 to 12 year old audience would really like all these poems but I still love the idea and I sent it to an, a an editor Dinah Stevenson who wrote me back in three weeks and said I love this story I love what you've done here but <laughs> you have so many notes at the end that you don't seem to be able to work into your poems. Would you ever think of writing it just as a straight book? Which I did, and it sold in, you know, about four months. That was May of 06. Now, it's very fitting that in church today, our minister had us read the passages of the dry bones in Ezekiel. because. I started this in 1999, 
Now it's 2006, and I got an award, and I had to give a talk for that award. And I talked about faith and faith in oneself, because I was getting very discouraged, but I wasn't selling anything. I was just writing this damn Excuse me. <laughs> you know, I was so obsessed with the book. And, but I want, was speaking to other writers, and I talked about how when you have a dry spell, you feel a lack of faith in yourself as a writer. And I said that one of the stories that helped me so much was the dry bones. That these bones were going to rise up. That I wasn't dead as a writer and these bones were going to rise up. And when I heard that today, I just thought it was really a fitting day. She picked up sound vibrations through touch. She said that she heard through her feet. She said, sound comes up from the floor to my head. And at one point, she was with her teacher, and her teacher was finger spelling to her, and Laura touched her hand and said, wait, my right foot is hearing something. <laughs> and then the teacher said, well, what about your left foot? And she said, my left foot doesn't hear so good. <laughs> Laura learned to write. And you can imagine, if your eyes are closed, that might not be the easiest thing to pull off, is writing your name. So I wanted you to try to close your eyes and write your name. Now, it's going to be, we won't do it now, but when you get home, you might want to try that. And the other thing is, you may find when you close your eyes and you write your name, it looks very similar when you open your eyes to the way it looks when you um, write it with looking at it. But then I want you to close your eyes and I want you to write two sentences. <laughs> and see how hard it is to write. And Laura learned to write and she wrote many, many letters. That box over there has been signed all the way. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Sarah.